From an Amnesty International perspective, I would say the biggest dream that we would have for education is to actually make the right to education a reality for every single child and adult in the world. Because education is a fundamental human right and it affects every single other right. And which is precisely why if you take the economic social rights covenant, uh, the right to education gets mentioned twice in two different articles. Um, and whereas for other economic social rights, governments have the option of uh, progressive realization, which means they could do it over time. For the right to education, they have been given only two years to come up with a clear delivery plan uh, to make sure that compulsory and free education is available to every child in the world. But the reality as we know it is that there's more than 250 million children who are out of school or who are not really learning much. And you can be sure that these numbers are severely underestimated. Now, if you go to the underlying reason why this is happening, um, you'd find in most contexts that the problem, uh, fundamental underlying problem is one of deep discrimination. And that's really a human rights issue, whether it's discrimination against girls, against minorities, ethnic groups, uh, disabled people, so multiple forms of discrimination and prejudice. So my dream is that we tackle this discrimination in a very head-on way. Amnesty International has done various studies. You take children in Afghanistan, for example, kids who are displaced uh, don't get access to education. Uh, Palestinian Arab children in Israel don't have access to education simply because of their, their antecedents. Uh, but it's not even just in poor countries. In some of the richest countries, the Czech Republic, for example, Roma children are discriminated and don't have access to education. So yes, my dream is that every child doesn't suffer from discrimination. Every adult who wants lifelong learning is not excluded from education. Every human being has a right to education. Um, and this is, uh, this is a fundamental right and the world and the international community and all of us need to work towards that end. There's no question. Uh, in fact, the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which almost every government in the world has signed up to, uh, is clear that human rights, human dignity, human values need to be taught in schools and colleges. Uh, think of the situation in Syria, for example, today, where we've had millions of people who've lost their lives, who are displaced, uh, lost their livelihoods. Uh, would this have happened if every individual in Syria had a respect for fairness, for equality, uh, for the other? Uh, so, And if you don't have this, you might have education. But what we're seeing in the world is increasing numbers of educated unemployed. Uh, what are we going to have in the world tomorrow if, if every child and every individual doesn't respect other people for, for their intrinsic worth? So yes, I think uh, there's a lot of lip service which is paid. Uh, in fact, the conventional rights to child insists that this included. But in reality, how many schools and how many universities and colleges deeply integrate human rights education? Amnesty International runs a global program called Human Rights Friendly Schools where it's fundamentally integrated into the way in which the school works. It's not a matter of just giving a lecture on human rights because uh, you know there's many lectures being given on civic responsibility, human rights, but it has to be internalized. It has to be converted into lived experience. And it's not in schools alone, but in every household. But absolutely the answer is it must be integrated and it must be done now. Corruption affects every aspect of human life. It's very unfortunate. Uh, but if you think about why uh, corruption affects education and affects everything else, uh, the, the fundamental problem in most societies, and this is particularly true in uh, emerging and developing countries, but it's not exclusively a problem of developing countries, but it's more prevalent in poor countries. And the reason why that is the case is because there is a complete lack of transparency and accountability. So if you want to tackle corruption, which is essential for us to make sure that every child has good quality education, uh, you have to address the issue of transparency and accountability. Without that, uh, there's, there is no way of tackling corruption. If you don't have, a, if you don't have rule of law, if you don't have human rights, um, if you don't have a system that gives every individual equal access to justice, you're not going to have uh, a solution to corruption. So, uh, and it is a deep disease. Uh, it cuts at the very fundamentals of the roots of uh, quality education and quality social services, particularly for the poor and the marginalized. So, uh, yes, corruption is an endemic disease 
but it can be tackled and it must be tackled. So the private sector is obviously a very key actor. Uh, the way the world has developed, they're becoming much more important than in the past in every domain of, uh, of human life, including in education. And um, I was recently in Myanmar, uh, in Burma, and you can imagine that this is now a new, a new economy, a new country which is just opening up, uh, new in the sense that it's, it's, it's new to opening up to the world. And every single corporation in the world wants to be in Burma and Myanmar today. And I'm using this as an ex a concrete example of what the private sector can do to respect human rights. Um, and this is a good example because the government there is very weak. And you could easily have uh, companies, particularly who are in the extractive industry, looking for mineral wealth going into that country and extracting the natural resources with little regard for human rights. Um, but the, but the reality is that you may be able to do that in the short run, but effectively what you're going to do is to destroy the social fabric of that country. It's a deeply divided, fractured country. And if you don't respect human rights in that country, if the people who are living in the areas where the mineral resources are located don't feel that they're getting a fair share of the wealth, you can be sure that there will be a destabilized uh, Burma or Myanmar in the future. So what, what, is, what do we mean by uh, human rights compliant uh, private sector approach? It's very simple. There's no great rocket science about it. What Amnesty International would say is that there is a set of U UN uh, agreed uh, human rights standards which, the, which businesses across the world have agreed to. So what we'd expect every single business to do is to ensure that there is due diligence put in place. But this due diligence is put in place ex ante, not after the event, but before the event. So before you have any investment going in, before you have any business activity, every business leader today has to make sure that they do a check, a test, see, to see what are the human rights implications or consequences of their investments, of their operations. Uh, so if you can think through this, logically to its to its end conclusion, you can be sure that any potential negative consequences are taken care of. Just as you do with, say, health and safety, just as you do with environmental damage, will your actions cause a human rights damage? So at least at a minimum, it's a do no harm. But ideally, businesses should be actually promoting human rights, promoting the basic values that underlie human rights. And I think they have a huge role to play there.